the American Indian Graduate Program Indigenous Peoples Day celebration. We're very excited to be here both virtually and in Anthony Hall, the new Native American Community Center on campus. Uh, to provide a little bit of a background for today's panel discussion, the UC Berkeley American Indian Graduate Program and the Berkeley Haas School of Business have designed a Native American Indigenous Peoples Day event designed to enhance the campus community's knowledge and awareness of contemporary Native American topics in graduate research and knowledge, excuse me, and, and career enhancement, graduate research and career enhancement. This panel will provide regarding, this panel will provide information regarding academic research interests, mentorship and career opportunities that align with emerging fields of Native American and indigenous perspectives at Berkeley specifically creating awareness towards the most pressing issues regarding indigenous communities and identities from a Berkeley's perspective. This event will further support the Haas diversity, equity and inclusion and belonging goals. Oh, one second, I lost my spot here. Excuse me. This event will further support the Haas DEIB goals in partnership with the American Indian Graduate Program and the Office of Graduate Diversity to increase representation of historically included, excluded identity of groups among students, staff, faculty, and leadership to better equip all students, faculty, staff, and alumni with the skills and knowledge to effectively lead diverse teams globally and to cultivate a climate of belonging for students, staff, faculty, and our alumni ensuring that no disparities exist across various identity groups. And so I would like to also begin with a land acknowledgement, uh, which will be very much a part of our conversation today. Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchin. The American Indian Graduate Program and the Office for Graduate Diversity recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchin, the original landscape of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This region continues to be of great importance to the Moekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since this institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native and indigenous peoples. As members of the Berkeley Graduate Division community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history upon the land we stand, but also we recognize that the Mekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited to have some good discussion uh, show, highlight some of the perspectives of our Berkeley Native community and talk a little bit more about allyship for Indigenous students and, and folks that are here. Uh, I would like to now introduce our panelists that are going to be joining us today. Um, first, we have Najun Menka. Uh, Najun is Koyukin, Athabaskan, and Lumbi. She is a Tribal Cultural Resource Project Policy Fellow here at Berkeley. And she joined Berkeley Law to serve as a cultural resources project policy fellow in 2020, September 2020. This is, this is conducting outreach to California indigenous communities to assess how the project can serve them as they exercise their sovereignty and build their capacities to advocate for the preservation, protection, and repatriation of sacred sites, homelands, ancestral remains, and cultural heritage. This project is supported by a grant from the Native American Heritage Commission and is working with the pro bono program at the law school to engage pro bono law students on this project. Born and raised in Alaska, Ms. June is Koyukin, Athabaskan, and Lumbee. She holds a JD from the University of Arizona James E. Rogers School of Law with a certificate in Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program and serves as of counsel at Rosette LLP, a national firm serving within Indian country. Before completing law school, Najun completed an MS in environmental chemistry at the University of Arizona, where she researched the impacts of pollutants at abandoned mining sites at Stanford's Particle Accelerator. She has worked on policy issues at the Alaska State Governor's Office, the Hawaii State, Hawaii State Legislature, 
and has completed various intern and management programs at the Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the House Committee on Natural Resources. Other areas of interest include indigenous human rights, indigenous ways of knowing, and environmental management, which are all intricately tied together. Her undergraduate degree is in public relations from the North Carolina State University, and she serves as treasurer on the board of directors for the Water Protector Legal Collective and for the Society of Advancement of Chicanos and Hispanics and Native Americans at SACNAS, in science, SACNAS. Uh, well, welcome, Nijun. Thanks. Our next panelist is Maya Rodriguez. Uh, Maya is a member of two groups whose lands are currently occupied by the US American Indians and Puerto Ricans. Uh, she is committed to the work of decolonization through her academic service and her research. Maya's current research rethinks the convergence of racialization and settler colonialism in the United States by considering together ethnic and Native American novels published in the wake of civil rights and power movements. Critical race and critical indigenous studies have understood Native American tribes who generally seek greater political autonomy through sovereignty and African Americans, Asian Americans and other minority groups who generally seek greater political inclusion through civil rights and have necessarily opposing and even incongruous objectives to liberation and resistance movements. Maya makes the case for a new sense of coalitionary potential through this focus of distinguishing feature of non-native ethnic American novels during the post-civil rights period, the presence of the indigenous American, by, by highlighting the presence of indigenous American characters and thus analyzing the indigenous presence through the lens of native American literary theory. Uh, Maya argues that African American, Asian American, and refugee novelists within this historical movement convey misgivings regarding the limitations of civil rights law for achieving enfranchisement and enfranchisement and alternative ground for resistance through alliance with American Indians. Welcome here today, Maya. We also have uh, an impromptu panelist filling in today, Marino Baca. Actually, I, I, forgive me, both Maya Rodriguez and Marino Baca are some of our incoming, incoming community diversity fellows. Uh, they are both within AIGP and uh, very excited to highlight them as within this capacity uh, as representatives from the Graduate Division and the Office of Graduate Diversity. Uh, Marino Baca is a, a double Bruin. Uh, he's working towards his MPH within the School of Public Health at Berkeley. He has earned both a BS in Society and Environment as well as the BS in Conservation and Resource Studies from Berkeley. He's proud to be a first generation native graduate student and is proud to bring his perspectives to an inst institution like Cal. Marino has engaged in community-based participatory research in Northern New Mexico while part of the Baca project during his time at the Bare Bones Lab under the, direct under the direction of Dr. June Sinceri. He is also a graduate student manager for the Cal football team and a proud father of two boys. Marino enjoys building community and spending time with loved ones. He also works towards outreach and retention of native and underserved youth populations. He strives to help others as much as possible and believes that respect, honesty, and integrity are essential, are essential to personal growth and development and that through hard work, persistence and resilience, you can achieve your goals. So thank you so much for joining us today, Marino, at the, at the last minute. Oh, it's a to be here, thank you. <laughs> so before we jump into the, the panel questions, uh, I did wanna provide another brief overview, right? Just so that folks in our audience are, are familiar with uh, the, the discussion that we would like to have. And maybe to develop some of your questions regarding awareness and allyship for indigenous and Native American students. Um, one second. So the American Indian Alaska Native Indigenous identified students considering grad school at Berkeley and also within indigenous academic fields of research lack role models. I, I myself am a former Native student and within this process, mentorship and role models really reinforces your own individual strategy to develop your own goals and succeed. 
Uh, we also lack resources that are aligned with career goals that can better support the pursuit of a college education and experience. One reason relates to the cultural, spiritual, and historical awareness pertaining to identity that has traditionally reinforced these spaces of learning, which can also deter indigenous students from considering contemporary applications in research within institutions of higher education, such as Berkeley. These kinds of barriers, which are often historic, historic within their interpretation, create obstacles for individuals progressing through career pathways at prestigious universities, given their indigenous student experience and background. And more importantly, their indigenous epistemologies, which reinforce the interest of their research and experience as a native student. Our discussion today will highlight the range and variation of cultural, spiritual, ethical issues that may be affecting and impacting American Indian, Alaska Native, Indigenous student and success within graduate fields of higher education. The goal of the AIGP HAS event is to further enhance graduate student services and knowledge about Indigenous people and Indigenous communities at Berkeley so that students can thrive in UC-wide graduate level programs rather than individually navigate education structures, educational structures that have historically denied their ind indigeneity and access. And so uh, with that being said, I think we can just maybe jump right into some good uh, Q&A here with our panelists. And we hope to leave a little room at the end to highlight a praxis uh, from a colleague of mine, Dr. Robin Minhorn, and hopefully uh, get some more questions from, from folks on, on the call and here at Anthony Hall. Um, but maybe just to start our conversation today, um, I don't know who would like to field this question first. Uh, and I will be repeating the question two times. That is a particular uh, request we have for this event from the audience. Um, to start our, our conversation, over the course of the last decade, Universities have found their way to acknowledge Indian country through campus land acknowledgements. We did start our event with, with the Ohlone landscape. And symbolic gatherings for a campus admits that it is located on the homeland of Native Americans. While certainly well intended, what are the purpose of these ceremonies? What do the purpose of these ceremonies serve? And what can be done further? Um, and let me repeat the question. Over the course of the last decade, universities have found their way to acknowledge Indian country through campus land acknowledgements and symbolic gatherings where a campus admits that it is located on the homeland of Native Americans. While certainly well intended, what purposes do you think these ceremonies serve? And what do you think could be done further? Yeah, and then I can start, I guess. Uh, so first and foremost, I think, you know, it's a step in the right direction to acknowledge, you know, not only our presence, but our history, right? There's indigenous people in every, you know, field, every industry, and we're still here and we're still flourishing, right? And so, um, like I said, I believe it's a step in the right direction for institutions that historically have kept people like us out, right? To acknowledge that not only are we existing within those institutions themselves, but you know, acknowledge the, the history of the land on where those institutions, you know, are and where they exist. Um, it's a step in the right direction. Obviously, there's still a lot more to go from there. Um, and, and we'll see where that where that kind of leads. But, um, but yeah, it's, just, it's a step in the right direction. We still have ways to go. Right? I'll jump in and then I'll drop off over to you, uh, Maya. I, you know, I'll just put it out there, right? Land acknowledgements are great, but without action following them, they're simply performative, you know, um, empty rhetoric. And so uh, the university um, hosted a webinar on this last semester, or was it almost a year ago, actually, I think, about a year ago, um, you know, beyond land acknowledgements and, and what are some of the things that we're looking forward to? Um, and I think, you know, establishing permanent places on campus to host indigenous communities are important. So we're sitting in Anthony Hall. This is a temporary solution, I believe. Um, you know, maybe it can actually be gifted to um, the Native American Studies Department. However, you guys would know, you know, the per, per, uh, 
preferred method and, and department and how that would be housed. Um, you know, I personally, you know, I've, I've gone to school in New Zealand on exchange. Um, I've been up on campus at the University of Washington. They have long houses there um, at UW and they have Marae, um, which are ceremonial traditional um, cultural centers for the Māori. And every single campus has a Marae and it's a special um, place. It brings you to that sense of place, right? That's really important to have that connection. Um, so I think, you know, the, the permanency aspect is really key. And I'm a policy fellow, I'm a lawyer. So I would always say that um, when it comes to um, action uh, beyond land acknowledgements, I would say that we need policies, right? That are gonna survive beyond our current institutional leadership and our current institutional um, staff, faculty, students, right? We're already tapped. <laughs> so let's create something that's a permanent change that requires tribal consultation with um, data policies, indigenous data sovereignty, right? So those are the kinds of things that I, I, um, I look for when they're uh, to determine whether or not a university or entity or institution is actually moving forward with sincerity. Are they following up in these ways um, in regard to indigenous communities? And I think a lot of these things could potentially apply to other communities, right? I think we're talking about indigenous erasure and memorializing indigenous nice. communities on campus you walk around the Berkeley campus, you're gonna see pretty much nothing that reminds you that this is Ohlone territory and that the university has known since its inception that this was traditional village land, that this is a traditional site, right? Um, you can find that when you deep dive into the information um, like I have, but uh, I think, you know, I'll end with and pass it over to Maya. This is, you know, it's about decolonization, right? We've got to, you know, address the systems of inequity and oppression and colonialism um, that are at the root and the foundations of these Western institutions. And so I think um, the first step is the land acknowledgement and it's a very, very tiny, tiny step. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was shaking my head through the whole thing. I don't know if everyone wants to <laughs> um, But yeah, I mean, so um, as someone who recently encountered so many of these land acknowledgements in um, applying on the job market, it's been really striking because so many institutions that you would not expect have them. Um, it's, in, it's incredible to kind of see them flourishing. At the same time, I think that um, I've been reflecting on the different ones that exist. And one of the things that I really like about Berkeley is, well, two parts. First, that it um, acknowledges um, that this land is still very important to the alone people, right? That there's, that we, that indigenous people are still here, um, that we're still around. I think that's something very important. I think for people who aren't familiar with the history, which are many, not only students, but also faculty, um, there's, it's, it's really easy to kind of see that as something past, right? Which is part of that kind of settler colonial discourse. Mm -hmm. um, um, and the second part that I really like about it, uh, about Berkeley's in particular, is that it acknowledges, um, uh, you know, the, there's, not, sorry, I'm forgetting the second part. Um, oh, oh, that, it, that, um, well, no, that the, that the um, students profit from it. Like everyone who mm. participates in, Ber at Ber in Berkeley, faculty, students, like we are all profiting from, um, you know, that, that uh, dispossession. Um, and I think that that is something right. so powerful to um, acknowledge. Um, and even in my own classroom, because it's become, um, you know, other, as, as a teacher, other um, graduate students will often ask me, you know, what I think about it and if they should use it. And my question to them, well, what else do you do to decolonize in the classroom, right? If, if you say that on the first day and then you just kind of gloss over it and it disappears and it's not part of your pedagogy. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, one of the things I kept shaking my head um, on was, was uh, this idea of um, place, right? Like if students aren't connected to place, if they're not connected to the land, if they're not aware um, of the place in which they're learning um, and that's not cultivated in the classroom, then it becomes this kind of, yeah, performative. It becomes, um, yeah, and so, so just to agree with what um, has already been said, which is that it's only the first step, right? And that there's more to it. Um, yeah. Great answers, you know, and, and for our audience uh, and in terms of developing awareness and good dialogue, they are a step in the right direction. And hopefully my next question for the panelists can help create some more of that dialogue of how these 
these things uh, impact how we feel on a day to day basis. And so the, the second question, I guess we can try a, the reverse order. We'll start with Maya. Um, can you describe how the Hollywood Indian and various mascot imagery affects the perception of all Native individuals? How does this create barriers regarding pertinent topics such as VAWA or the Violence Against Women Act and missing and murdered Indigenous women, MMIW topics within that conversation? Uh, second repeat. Can you describe how the Hollywood Indian and various mascot imagery affects the perception of all Native individuals? And how does this create barriers regarding pertinent topics such as VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, and missing and murdered Indigenous women? Yeah, so I think, so I was actually going to, uh, in my, my last, uh, uh, when I was talking about um, the kind of theme, I mean, for, Hol for the Hollywood Indian, I always kind of think of this theme of like vanishing, right? the idea that um, that indigenous people no longer exist or, or uh, aren't, aren't still here. Um, and I think that the Hollywood Indian contributes to that in many ways, but one of the ways is kind of, and I think this speaks to kind of the um, misinformation that a lot of people have, been, have, um, have kind of come to believe is that, I mean, I think that, I mean, any kind of stereotypical in, um, imagery, right, which is especially in Hollywood, but also in mascot imagery, flattens identity, right? Like it's a, it's a caricature of identity. And I think there's a lot of ways in which um, people, even the best meaning people, don't, um, people who are very, um, you know, uh, would be considered very well informed, um, are still somehow not aware of like how that indigenous identity is so multiform, right? That there's um, you know, different, depending on where people are coming from, that there's a borderless indigenous identity. I think that in very many ways, um, indigenous identity has been flattened. Um, and I think that um, just contributing, thinking about, um, I think that um, that's kind of one of the ways in which I kind of see the Hollywood and the mascot injury um, affecting perception, right? This, um, yeah. And then um, to the second part of the question, um, which is kind of how that creates barriers um, regarding recent, um, regarding um, VAWA and um, the difficulty of achieving justice for a missing and um, murdered indigenous women is kind of speaking to that question of erasure, right? Um, the, I mean, just thinking about um, the, the fact that um, until recently, um, this, and I mean, this problem has been so persistent within the indigenous community, within, um, and for our communities um, and has been very much at the forefront of our minds. And at the same time, it's, been, it's gone very um, un, unrecognized in the public eye, right? Um, and there's a way in which, I mean, part of the, part of the crisis is, is this fact that um, there, aren't, there isn't a huge outcry um, for um, justice for these women. Um, and I think that, I mean, the kind of flattening um, and erasure um, that um, these kind of um, stereotypes perform uh, contributes to that. Thank you for that answer. Um, Marino. Yeah, so um, the fact that we're talking about Hollywood Indian and that stereotype, right? Um, this morning, actually, uh, when I was getting ready for the day, uh, my son was watching a TV show, right? And this is, a, you know, he's four years old. This is a kid's cartoon. And what do I see, right? I see, you know, the cartoon with, you know, uh, feathers in the hairs and, you know, just the Hollywood Indian portrayal. And so to me, it's really frustrating because it takes away from our existence now, right? It, it constantly puts us back in history, right? And I think this speaks to the second part of the question uh, because these current topics, right? These current events that are going on that need to be highlighted and addressed and looked at seriously, kind of get overlooked and it puts it in the past, right? And it puts it as if it's not relevant because natives are only in the past, we only exist in the past, right? So moving beyond the Hollywood Indian and the mascot imagery is really important for not, not only our community, but you know the US as a whole, because we're here, we're flourishing, we exist, we are leaders and until that is recognized and we move past this 
you know, nostalgic image of, you know, an Indian with feathers in his hair and a headdress on a horse, you know, going to Starbucks. That, you know, <laughs> we're not going to get past that, right? We're here, you know, we're just like everybody else, right? We have our experience, we have our history, we have our culture, right? And this takes away from that. Um, but yeah. So I'll try to fill in places that I didn't hear <laughs> covered. Um, you know, it's well documented, right? It, it's been almost a decade since I, I think this, um, the Psychologist Association was did a study and was like, this is psychologically harmful to indigenous youth now, mm -hmm. right? And so we're talking about like contemporary um, harmful effects and they go beyond just, you know, a caricature. Um, and I think one of the, the, the stories and the narratives that I've been trying to really like bring to the forefront when we think about these things, you know, including things like indigenous erasure is the historic use um, of dehumanization, right? And othering to allow the United States federal government to allow imperialistic nation building efforts to dehumanize people in order to um, justify right colonization, in order to justify genocide, in order to justify Indian boarding schools, right? Save the Indian, or <laughs> well, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> kill the Indian, exactly. Kill the Indian, save the man. Kill the Indian save the man. We, you know, we've got to laugh at, at, at things sometimes because that's our survival technique, yeah. right? Um, but I think the dehumanization aspect ties in really well and, and thanks for linking this together with the missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, hurdles that we face on a daily basis, right? Um, those systems of dehumanization and of genocide um, are really rooted in um, a level of patriarchy that we don't discuss, right? And so indigenous mm -hmm. women have been specifically targeted throughout the history of the European imperialistic history of the United States. Um, you know, there's some really wonderful uh, work coming out on native feminisms um, recently by uh, Dr. Kacha Rising Walby. She's, uh, I re highly recommend how she connects this narrative through personal story, but also in bringing in that history of dehumanization, the history of colonialism, especially the history of California genocide. Um, and so I would, you know, uh, encourage people to engage with that type of work that is coming out of the work that us indigenous scholars are doing, right? Now that we have entered into the academy, we're moving through this progression of we're moving from survivance to thriving, right? Um, and but we're just getting started. Like we we have literally only been in the academy um, for a few days, <laughs> right? Um, and so, yeah, thank you for that question. Great answer. And, and to follow up with uh, Najun's um, answer, Stephanie Freiberg uh, does tremendous work on the psychological effects of mass imagery for indigenous populations. Um, and so the next question, and I hope everyone uh, is, is following along here, we're very much trying to impact some good, good dialogue. Um, the commitment of colleges and universities to Native American Indigenous identified students must include critically examining their curriculum and campus. Here at UC Berkeley, what does a contemporary Indigenous identity feel, look, sound like within these spaces? specifically in navigating the dual applications in both culture and academia. And let me, let me repeat that again. The commitment of colleges and universities to Native American indigenous identified students must include critically examining their curriculum and campus. Here at UC Berkeley, what does a contemporary indigenous identity feel, look, sound like within these spaces, specifically navigating the in culture and academia. And um, I guess we can start with Marina. Yeah, so um, so just from personal experience, right? Being here at Berkeley as an undergraduate, being the first person in my family, my entire community, you know, to make it out um, and to, to really be in this position, um, you know, first and foremost, I have to acknowledge and be, be grateful for that. But if we're going to talk about how do we get Native students and Indigenous students to remain here, well, we have to make sure they're supported, right? And that's been one of the biggest uh, barriers and, and things lacking, I think, of my experience so far being here at Cal, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm looking to, you know, transition into a PhD program here soon and, 
without that support, without the community that I've been able to find just on my own, you know, by, you know, building the community with Native folks on campus, I don't think I would ever found that if it wasn't for that, right? And um, going back to, like I said, if we, if we want to recruit and, re you know, retain Native and Indigenous students, we have to make sure there are, you know, programs and resources put in place to keep them here, right? One of the biggest things is funding, right? The, the, the myth of, oh, all Indians get a check, right, from the <laughs> government. Come on, how many, how many times have I heard that? Like, countless times since I've been here, right? Whether it's in athletics here, on campus, professors, whatever it may be, the ignorance is real. And that myth, you know, people think that we're getting those checks, right? It's not true. Um, but let's, like I said, figure out how to keep us here. Well, funding is one of the most important things. A lot of us come from really poor backgrounds, first generation backgrounds. And if we don't have that support financially, then no matter how much we want to be here, no matter what the work is that we're doing, you know, in the academy, we can't sustain ourselves, especially in high cost areas like the Bay Area, right? Um, and so, yeah, that's just been a little bit of my experience, uh, but but I know that extends real, real beyond just me, uh, so yeah. And, and thank you for your response and, and for our audience, right? The idea of hosting this awareness discussion is to bring inclusion to the identities and the needs of our neighbors. Right? And so I, I wanted to mention that before we move over to the next response. Um, Nijun? Sure. Um, well, I think there's there's a lot in this question, right? And so I think initially I was like, um, can I get some more specificity? <laughs> <laughs> However, um, Given the, the way that um, Mana has approached it, I think I'll say that while there needs to be, you know, clear opportunities for, you know, curriculum, I think the Native American Studies Department does a good job of that. Um, there's not a lot, there's a lot of silos of separation in the university world. Um, and that is just not how indigenous worldviews operate. Um, I initially, as um, Patrick had introduced me, I was doing a chemistry PhD program before I uh, left and decided to go to law school. And in that program, I was really struggling to connect my desire to um, move um, toward problem solving driven by the needs of the community while also getting a degree to satisfy the needs of the systems that were at play um, and programmatic requirements, right? And so the, the amount of flexibility that could be brought to create more indigenous academics that supports our ways of knowing is, is huge, right? Um, I think the university system needs to understand that flexibility needs to be taken into consideration when you are dealing with, um, you know, people who do not necessarily think that the written word is the only way to express knowledge and to share and transmit knowledge, mm. right? Oral history in our communities is huge. Storytelling is huge. Um, it wasn't until critical race theory kind of became, you know, um, cool in the legal field where we'd be allowed to share our stories in law review articles, right? Um, and I, I think still to this day, some people, you know, eschew that as anecdotal evidence. Um, but for our communities, I think, you know, there's a reframing that needs to take place um, when it comes to, you know, these Western exclusionary systems. Um, so we need to be, I think, a little bit more supportive of interdisciplinary um, doctoral programs, allow students with less of flexibility to incorporate and bring their worldview to these Western institutions. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, so just to kind of, um, fill in also the, everyone's incredible points, um, is um, definitely um, interdisciplinary, take discipline, name of it, take, um, kind of even meeting the new students who come in and are, you know, want to do something, um, you know, that kind of bridges fields and feeling that there's not a home for them, right, if they come here. Um, um, and Berkeley being one of a good, like a good, pretty good institution in that, in that regard. And uh, in that, I think that there's, because Native American Studies has been, um, has, has had such a long time here, it's ahead of the curve, even in, at other institutions where it's a little younger. Um, and then the other, but the other um, point that I wanted to speak to um, was um, also kind of, I mean, my own experience of feeling like um, I had to um, really fight for the, the um, 
to be able to say things um, and to kind of, um, you know, speak to or incorporate um, indigenous epistemologies and indigenous knowledge, system, knowledge systems into um, like my field and communities um, and kind of getting pushback on that and really feeling like that's not rigorous, right? Mm -hmm. That there's like that there's some kind of lack in that um, and having to kind of, I think too, um, you know, um, at first <laughs> I think kind of, um, what is it contort myself into this mm -hmm. kind of um, serious scholar, right? Or a scholar that was gonna be taken seriously. Um, and I think one of the most, I mean, I think Marino spoke to this, but one of the most liberating things for me was to kind of find, um, you know, I didn't, ha I came in without having a very strong um, Native community in the Bay Area. And when I finally found that, and when I finally found that at Berkeley, um, being able to have those conversations, um, uh, I remember like one of the funnest things last year was, a, um, was our um, Crossing Paths um, uh, um, colloquium where we where we bring together an undergraduate student and a graduate student, um, native graduate student and native undergraduate student to kind of present on their research and kind of the conversations that happened within that like one hour um, were some of the richest conversations that I've had in graduate school on these <laughs> issues. So it was kind of it, but it was just seeing that 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 um, being able to flourish um, when um, you know there's yeah and and also kind of funding speaking to that. Um, uh, in my one department, there's only one faculty member that works on um, that works on indigenous literatures, and they um, are not native. So it's like a very interesting um, way to kind of be crafting your um, your your own curriculum when you're here. I um, mean, I think that speaks to the interdisciplinarity. Um, and then the last, the other thing I want to say. Oh, and then what does a contemporary indigenous identity feel like and sound like within these spaces? I mean, just on campus. I've been very interested recently in like, I mean, a borderless indigenous identity, right? Because mm -hmm. I think that's very much, um, it, it can contribute to the erasure um, of um, indigenous peoples from Central America or South America, right? Um, and I think that um, kind of inclusion is a really big part of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just, just kind of share a story I heard recently as part of um, as part of AIGP and as part of working with, as a fellow with the AIGP and the Office of Graduate Diversity, a student came to me um, asking, tell, sharing with me that a faculty member, um, uh, you know, asked them why their last name was Spanish, quote unquote, right? If, if they were indigenous, right? If they were native. Um, and like, it just, that's a first year student and kind of that violence coming from yeah. a faculty member right, is supposed to be right, very important, right. you know? Um, just kind of thinking about those issues that might face students on campus, right? Like the, not only the erasure, but also the, um, you know, also kind of the microaggressions, the violences that might happen from people that they look up to and respect from people in authority um, who, yeah, who just don't know, um, but are otherwise kind of these people in, you know, the esteems of the academy. <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah, and naming that as violence, yes. right? I mean, that's the important thing. Thank you for that answer. You know, I want to mention a couple of things, right? You know, the I mentioned intersectionality a lot on behalf of the, the American Indian Graduate Program, but I wanted to mention that today because I really feel that that speaks to the Berkeley opportunity to better join these conversations, right? One of the things that Maya mentioned in, in the June was a Western, non-Western kind of a format or application for these things. And Maya was very clear around a borderless uh, identities for indigeneity because it's very true the indigenous through an intersectional lens resides worldwide mm -hmm. uh, with multiple identities and ethnicities right and just like what uh, Najun mentioned uh, studying in New Zealand for mm -hmm. a, a little part of her career I really feel that developing inclusion around these conversations is how spaces like UC Berkeley can do better uh, and, and redress some of these, these conversations. Um, I, I really feel like each of the panelists answered the following two questions uh, very, very well. And I can revisit those, but I kind of wanted just based off of the discussion to jump right into this question. Um, and it, forgive me, I'll have to ask twice. How can administrators, professional staff and faculty be trained to provide opportunities to get to know students without inserting preconceived notions and biases against Native American indigenous identified people? How can administrators, professional staff, and faculty be trained to provide opportunities to get to know students without inserting preconceived notions and biases 
against Native American and Indigenous identified people. Um, <laughs> Can I ask a clarifying question? <laughs> so are you asking, you know, how the university can actively ensure they're engaging with diverse communities in a culturally appropriate way? Or are you asking something else? Or a preconceived bias against an Indigenous person that they may not be aware of within that setting. How, how are our Indigenous populations highlighted within these biases that tend to exist generally within any space? Um, so there, number one, I think one of the problems that I come across, and I think all of us um, that are, you know, attending can uh, identify with is that all too often, like our community is tapped out, right? Like we have um, no more time <laughs> to give to educate folks that are being paid to do their jobs, right? And so, um, Number one, I would like to see, you know, more equity on leadership, right? I, I know we have a new um, diversity dean here at the university. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a truth telling forum happening tomorrow, for example. Um, those things are great. But I do think that we need consistent um, indigenous representation, uh, black representation, Asian representation, right? We need that representation, representation across the board. And those positions need to be paid positions, right? So we've got Native American student development, um, people that are supporting us, you know, in this room currently. Um, and then, you know, we've got folks that are volunteering, the students who are actually the ones who generally lead the movements and make progress and push the universities and administration to create change, right? Um, and so I think that if, if faculty and staff is, are, are asking, you know, if administrators are asking, you know, how do I do better? Um, that information is readily available to you at any point in time, right? I don't necessarily think that it's appropriate to ask students. Um, actually, I think it's inappropriate to ask students to do that work, that emotional labor without compensating them. Um, and so I think I'll just, I'll end that there. Thank you for that answer. Um, Maya. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, so, well, I was gonna. I mean, I was. Gonna, I was even thinking about. I mean, speaking to leadership. I mean, I also think that. I mean, speaking to kind of uh, Moreno's earlier question of funding, right? I mean, I think that also speaks to people in in the field, right? Like how our campus looks, how our faculty looks, um, uh, and because because even seeing right now, um, going back to the question to one of our earlier questions, even seeing right now um, the kind of headways that have been that have been made just from having more indigenous representation at large, right? In in our media, in our um, you know, you know, you know, in the public, right? In the public eye, um, has completely, I think, really enriched people like non-natives understanding. Um, and I'm can I can I can only see that contributing um, um, on campuses, right? Um, if people see a kind of um, if people are, you know, have more if there is more representation in our leadership, um, in our faculty, um, I'm, I, I hope that that, that that would be able to contribute um, to people's understanding of, um, yeah, uh, I, to, to kind of, you know, to combat preconceived notions or biases that come from um, the harmful things that we discussed earlier, right? Like, right. like the Hollywood thing. Um, yeah, so I guess that would be. That would be. Yeah, um, great answers, Bobby. Um, I really agree with the point that was brought up. Um, it's really unfair to put that on us, right? To put that on us as students, right? Both undergraduates, graduates, but also as the community as a whole, right? Uh, these people are in these positions. They've earned their way there through, you know, their experience, their, their, you know, education, what have you. But for them to be in these positions at a place like Berkeley, where they have access to this information, it's up to them to go out and find it. Why is it up to us to go and teach them, right? Mm -hmm. um, or to tell them, right? Um, and we see that, you know, in, in, in almost every facet when it's constantly brought back to us and the ball is put in our hands. And, you know, well, we need you, we need you, right? Yeah. Well, where are our positions? Mm -hmm. Where are my people? Who can I go to 
and ask, how do I get to that next level, right? When there's a space that is here now in Anthony Hall that hasn't existed up until now, that's still not our own, right? But yet you still want our help, right? Um, but I guess to, to go back to answer this in a more simple way, right? Treat us as a person, treat us as your equal, right? We're still here, we're still flourishing, we're still gonna do this work, whether we have to do it with your support or without your support, right? But if you want us to educate you, then you also have to help us continue to grow as a community. Yeah, so I had, I had a note and I was like, all of this type of work, like it requires the funding, like we've been talking about, you know, they can't expect diverse students, faculty and staff to lead the way without pay, right? Like pay us to serve on these committees if you want us to do this work, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's just, you know, the way it should be. And people are like, oh, but you're volunteer, you're, you know, no, no, I need to be paid. Are you paying us, Patrick? <laughs> so I was preparing. That's a better question. You know, I, I wanted to to uh, share an answer to this question somewhat as well, right? Because what excites me the most about providing AIGP through uh, you know an intersectional conversation is that these are who our graduate students are. Mm -hmm. This is where they are at the moment. This is where they belong at Berkeley, and this is what we need to do better. And so. You know, I, I wanted to mention that because we need to better support the intersectional identities of our graduate students all together. And uh, maybe folks didn't know that a lot of them might be indigenous within that conversation, right? Um, and moving into our final question before we close, because I know we're at the 10 minute mark, nine minute mark. Um, utilizing that intersectional approach uh, with towards your indigenous experience, what are some of the other aspects you wish others knew about the indigenous identity? And, and I got to ask again, hold on. Utilizing an intersectional approach towards the indigenous experience, what are some of the other aspects you wish others knew about indigenous identity? Yeah, I mean, I could go ahead and start with this one. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the point of we're still here, right? We exist, we're not in the past, we're not just a historical, you know, presence from back in the day. Like, no, we're here right now, right? We are in this era, just like everyone else, right? Treat us that way, right? But also speaking to the intersectionality of it, right? Beyond our borders, and my brought this up, um, and this is something I'm real big on, right? Indigeneity exists outside of these borders that we're putting right? And the knowledge, the history, um, and the presence that comes from that impacts all of us, right? Not just as an Indigenous community, but as a whole, as an institution in Berkeley, right? And so really understanding that, respecting that, and treating us, like I said earlier, as equals, as if we're still here and what we do matters, is, is an important aspect. Mm -hmm. You want to go? Yeah. I'm blaming. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so when I saw that anything that regarding indigenous identity, it is so complicated. I can't even begin to tell you how complicated it is. <laughs> Let me <Yeah>. try. <laughs> I'll start with myself, right? So I'm looking at myself and at what my identity is, mm -hmm. right? So we had we had we were going to talk about right this political ideology, right? That indigenous folks in the United States have a political uh, group affiliation, a, a government to government relationship with the United States. All right, so that's that's one thing, right? That requires, you know, so quote unquote federal recognition, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not in, I'm not down with um, colonial governments telling me and recognizing me in that way, whether or not I'm native enough for them and, mm -hmm. and whether or not my blood quantum meets their requirements or whether they're, you know, 1934 Indian Reorganization Act tribal constitution, you know, template that reduced me to a number is you know important to my identity right i have a certificate of indian blood that is bizarre but that is part of this weird colonial system and That's my right. identity now right my mother's tribe is lumbee from north carolina they're state recognized they don't get all these little federal benefits we can argue about how great those are but um that's a complicated identity my name Najum, is danaka it's athabascan I never said the word Danaka until maybe four years ago. 
Okay, so my dictionary came out in 2000. My name is spelled completely different in there, right? Why am I mentioning this? Colonization has stripped identity, has stripped language, has stripped mm -hmm. culture. Um, our cultures are sitting over in the first museum, right? Mm -hmm. There's stuff from Alaska there, right? My people stuff from Alaska is sitting across you know, the way at the Hearst Museum right now as we speak, I don't have as much identity of myself and my cultural, you know, belongings. Um, you know, I've got a few things that I've curated for myself lately, but the Hearst Museum literally has more of my identity and cultural knowledge of, than I do have of my own right now. So, right, and so what? I, why do I bring these things up? It's so important that we start to talk about the fact that we have had our identity stripped from ourselves and that, we need to be treating one another with the utmost compassion. Someone asked me once, well, you don't speak Spanish, you don't speak your language. And I was like, I'm sorry, wrong colonizer. You know, so, I mean, we need to be thinking about these things in the holistic way, right? I love the way that you framed this, you know, borderless indigeneity, and I'm, I'm with it, I'm on board. I've been trying to talk about people with this, so we're gonna have to connect, but yeah, leave your judgment at the door when it comes to identity um, and let us like define it for ourselves. That was my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> great, great closing thoughts, my man. Great passion right there. Um, oh my God, I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, what are some of other aspects? I mean, I think that one of, I mean, I think that um, Najin spoke to this so well of, of, um, of, of, of how many layers there are to um, indigenous identity. Um, and the, the, like the multitudes that exist. Um, and, you know, also that, um, you know, indigenous identity comes from so many things, it comes from tribal affiliation, it comes from maybe not tribal affiliation, right? It, it comes from, um, you know, where your region, place, right? Like that, that's kind of where we, um, you know, that's so many ways um, where it, the way in which our identities are layered, right? And that place, that sense of place is also affected by displacement, right? Um, so many indigenous peoples, um, you know, you know, live in cities. That's something that people um, are like yeah, mind blown, right? Um, that that <laughs> just speaking to just kind of, I guess, just expanding on um, Nijun's understanding or, like, you know, this idea that she brought up of, of the multiple layers that exist, right? From policy, um, from displacement, um, from laws, from borders, it's all kind of, um, you know, put upon us, right? And that's, and it's, it's very interesting to navigate, um, you know, what's ours and, and what kind of comes from this kind of settler colonial um, patchwork. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. No, we're, we're, we're two minutes out, but I, I really want to thank each one of you for wonderful discussion and awareness of planning these kinds of events and watching your perspectives for others that need to know is truly why I, I do this. And I want to thank each one of you for your, your time and discussion today. Um, I, I know that we, we're running out of time. Uh, and we, I don't think we'll have a little bit of, of uh, time left to do a Q&A with the audience, but I did want to show a, a praxis from a colleague of mine at the University of Washington, Dr. Robin Minthorn, who has developed just, I think, a helpful kind of like reference to some of the institutional things that, that you know, Western college spaces can do to better meet the needs of Native students. You know, the, the list is, is very clear for designing and engagement, but they don't really need to be approached in such a formal process to just better meet the needs of your native students, right? Some of the examples that are highlighted on this list are to invest in a tribal liaison. Now, that doesn't need to be a particular individual or somebody who is down the hall from the chancellor, so to speak, but somebody who can better make sense of these dialogues and, and these histories that our panelists talked about today that are still very much a part of their graduate student experience, right? Uh, another one would be to embed Native Americans in the Board of Regents. Now, again, this does not mean to be a direct request, but how do we complement these histories and identities that have been lacking from these spaces, right? That become 
very specific to the state of California and the institutions that make us community. And so I wanted again to thank each one of you for wonderful discussion. Uh, and please let me know if you have any follow-up questions. There are no stupid questions around designing this dialogue and I can be reached, we can be reached at uh, AIGP at berkeley.edu. And thank you so much for, for your time today. That will conclude our event. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.